Um, I'm also writing a book on neuroscience and the legal system, which is, um, I think as you guys know, I, I direct the initiative on neuroscience and law, which brings together neuroscientists and judges and lawyers and policymakers and ethicists and computer scientists and statisticians under this umbrella. And, um, you know, uh, it's meant to figure out how modern neuroscience will navigate the way we make social policy. So I give free advice to defense lawyers all the time on this book. I get, I get calls about once a week from a defense lawyer saying, hey, I want you to do a brain scan of my client, show that there's something wrong with his brain so we can use this as mitigating evidence. And so I, first of all, tell them that I don't do that because I keep the initiative clean from any particular cases. But the piece of free advice is, um, that won't work. If you prove to the jury that there's something wrong with your client's brain, they'll say, great, let's fry him for sure. So there's some amount of misunderstanding about biological mitigation in this way. It's not, it's not going to help anybody. Um, there are exceptions though, which is if, uh, if a person, for example, has a brain tumor, which has been happening more and more in the courts, in part because we can measure these things better. So somebody gets a brain tumor, it completely changes their decision making, that sort of thing is operable, and the person can be returned to exactly the kind of person he was before. And so those are very, those are very interesting cases, and that's where it does make sense to bring up these things. But if somebody is, is a psychopath or has some congenital problem with the development of his brain that makes him like a rabid dog, then there's no sense in which biological mitigation helps there. <laughs> what my colleagues and I are building right now is a completely new method uh, for rehabilitation, for drug rehabilitation. And so this is based on the uh, framework that I built in Incognito, which is that the brain operates like a team of rivals. So you've got all these different parts of the brain that are fighting it out, and this is why. You know, if I put some warm chocolate chip cookies in front of you here, part of your brain wants to eat it because it's a rich energy source. And part of your brain says, don't eat it, you're going to get fat. And you can argue with yourself and cuss at yourself and cajole yourself and contract with yourself. So the question is, who's talking with whom here? Well, it's all, it's all you, but it's different parts of your brain that operate at different time scales and have different tries. And so your brain is like a representative democracy with all these different political parties that are all trying to compete to steer the ship of state. So um, it turns out that we can then leverage that to help people who are trying to break a drug addiction but have been unsuccessful. So 90% of these cocaine addicts don't want to be an addict. I mean, it costs them a lot of money, it's ruined their life, they've lost their job, lost their spouse, whatever. So um, they want to quit, but you know, for anyone who's tried to break an addiction, it's difficult. So what we do is we put people in the scanner, we use what's called real-time feedback in neuroimaging where we measure the parts of their brain involved in craving. We show them pictures of cocaine, we say go ahead and crave, we measure those networks, and we represent the activity in those networks by a bar on the screen. And their job is to make that bar go down. So they surf through their mental space and they figure out what they need to do to squelch their craving. And what they're doing is they're using their prefrontal cortex, the front part of their brain here, to learn how to control their impulses. So I call this the prefrontal gym because they're just strengthening it up and they get to practice over and over making this bar go down. And uh, we've, we've been working on this for about a year. We don't know for sure this is gonna work, but it probably will. We think it's, it's very likely to. And if it does, it's a total game changer for the legal system because what we do currently is we, well, I don't know about Canada, but in the US, we incarcerate everybody. Our prisons are stuffed with drug addicts. That's not the right place to put drug addicts. It's got all these collateral consequences, like you break their employment opportunities and their social circles, and you give them new social circles and new skills. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so prison becomes criminogenic. It causes more crime, actually. Um, so, you know, and, and, and this war on drugs is completely unwinnable. I don't know what you guys do, but we spent $40 billion a year on it. And it's attacking the drug supply, which can never win because it's like a water balloon. If you press down one place, it comes up somewhere else. If you want to address the drug problem, you have to address drug demand, which is the brain of the addict. And so, um, you know, we know so much about the circuitry and pharmacology of drug addiction at this point, and that's what neuroscience can immediately bring to the system is, look, here's a way that we don't have to incarcerate everybody. Um, you know, there are many other areas that, uh, you know, for example, cognitive neuroscience over the last 30 years has figured out a great deal about eyewitness testimony and the fallibility of it. And so, um, you know, as a group of scientists around the world, what we've been able to do is put together this you know, best practices for eyewitness lineups and, and testimony and stuff like that. Ways of reducing the amount of error and pollution and these sorts of things. Um, in the United States, a third of the prison population has mental illness, which means our prison population, you know, our prisons have become our de facto mental health care facilities. And so there's lots of, you know, anyway, there, you know uh, lie detection, uh, how to define brain death, uh, thinking about the insanity defense. 
Um, there are so many places where neuroscience and legal system intersect, so that's, that's my next project there.